In 1977, two airliners collide on Spanish island Tenerife, resulting in the deadliest accident in aviation history, killing nearly 600. The accident could have been avoided altogether were it not for the many coincidences that led to the two airliners being in the exact same place at the exact same time. For example, neither craft was even supposed to be in Tenerife that day. An astonishing number of small incidents and details snowballed into a catastrophe that would have been avoided had any of them not occurred. The great tragedy of this crash is that those incidents aligned precisely when they did. Had they occurred hours, minutes or even seconds out of sequence, the crash would have never have happened. Unfortunately, it did. And this is how. <laughs> March 27th, 1977, KLM Flight 4805 is scheduled to arrive at Gran Canaria Airport of the Canary Islands after departing from Amsterdam, Netherlands. The 747 is piloted by Captain Van Zanten and carries 235 passengers. The same day, Pan Am Flight 1736 is also headed for Gran Canaria. It has departed from Los Angeles International Airport with an intermediate stop at JFK Airport. Also a 747, it is carrying 380 passengers and is flown by Captain Grubbs. Notably, this particular aircraft flew the 747's inaugural commercial flight in 1970. That same year, it also became the first 747 ever hijacked. Both flights will have to be diverted, however, as a bomb planted by Canary Islands independence movement separatists explodes in the terminal of the Gran Canaria airport shortly after 1pm. Eight people are injured and the airport is temporarily closed while authorities search for a suspected second bomb. With fuel to last them hours, the Pan Am flight crew indicate they'd prefer to hold in the air until the search is complete, but they are ordered to land at Los Rodeos Airport on nearby Tenerife, along with many other flights that had to be diverted for the same reason. Among these flights is the KLM aircraft. While waiting, Captain Van Zanten allows passengers of the KLM flight to disembark and roam the Los Rodeos terminal. One of these passengers, who was heading to Tenerife the next day anyways, decides not to reboard the aircraft, a decision that will make her the flight's only survivor. Both KLM and Pan Am flights are faced with hours of waiting while the Gran Canaria airport is searched. Eventually, Captain Van Zanten decides to refuel now instead of at Gran Canaria, seeing as he is going to be grounded anyways. Coincidentally, Gran Canaria airport gives the all clear just after he had called for refueling, so he has now inadvertently cost himself another half hour or so stuck at Los Rodeos airport while he waits for the refueling process. This has also cost the Pan Am flight. The Los Rodeos airport was not designed to accommodate all the diverted traffic and the two massive 747s find themselves with little room to maneuver. The Pan Am flight is stuck behind the KLM craft and will not be able to leave until the KLM craft is refueled and no longer blocking the way. This refueling will play a critical role in the following disaster. By the time both 747s are ready to depart, a thick fog will have descended on the runway. The added fuel has also made the KLM craft heavier and it will be less nimble as it takes to the air. These are both factors that will play into the crash. Eventually, KLM is ready to depart. Because of the added traffic at the small airport, the normal route to the runway is blocked. Instead, departing aircraft will have to perform a back taxi. That is, they will taxi down the runway before turning 180 degrees around and performing takeoff in the opposite direction of the same runway. Another detail that will prove fatal. As KLM taxis down the runway, air traffic control instructs Pan Am to follow, just as a cloud of fog rolls onto the runway. They will then take the third exit off the runway so that KLM can safely take off before using the taxiway to continue their journey to the end of the runway. They must use exit 3 for the same reason KLM must back taxi. The preceding stretch of taxiway is blocked by diverted aircraft. 
By now, the fog has made visibility poor, not just for the flight crews, but for the control tower. They also have no ground tracking radar, so whatever's happening on the runway, they can't see it. When KLM reaches the end of the runway and turns around, it requests ATC clearance. These are instructions about the route the aircraft is going to take and are usually given well before the aircraft makes it to the runway. Of course, today is a day of exceptional circumstances. Due to poor visibility and signage, Pan Am misses the third exit. As they taxi past it, they must now head for the fourth exit instead. After ATC clearance is given, the KLM crew seem to mistakenly believe they are now cleared to depart and announce that they are at takeoff. This leads to some confusion in the control tower who seem to think that KLM's announcement signifies that they are standing by for takeoff. Air traffic control responds with an OK. In reality, KLM takes this to mean that they will now be taking off and starts accelerating down the runway unable to see the Pan Am craft taxiing towards them. Sensing there may have been a miscommunication, air traffic control then clarifies that KLM should stand by for takeoff and will be called when clear. The Pan Am crew also felt that there may have been a misunderstanding and at the exact same time radioed to alert that they were still in KLM's path on the runway. The simultaneous calls from Pan Am and the control tower interfered with each other on the radio frequency, meaning, unbeknownst to them, all KLM heard was OK, followed by a squeal of radio interference. Either message would have halted KLM in its tracks, but because they were sent at the very same second, neither is heard. As they continue their takeoff, a confused KLM flight engineer asks his pilots if the Pan Am craft is clear of the runway. Captain Van Zanten seems to think they are. The KLM craft is only several hundred meters away when it comes into view of Captain Grubbs and his crew. The Pan Am crew exclaim at the sight of the 747 suddenly emerging from the fog at takeoff speed. Captain Grubbs applies full throttle and makes a sharp left turn in an attempt to get out of the way. At the same time, the KLM crew is horrified to see that they are barreling straight towards the Pan Am. Captain Van Zanten desperately attempts liftoff, slamming the tail of the aircraft into the ground. The KLM's nose flies over the Pan Am, but it is not enough. The body plows through the Pan Am, continuing down the runway before crashing. The full load of fuel ignites and the craft is engulfed in a fireball. All 248 aboard KLM Flight 4805 are killed. The fire will rage on for hours. The Pan Am's upper deck is shorn from the plane. The crew in the cockpit look up and see that there is no ceiling. When they look back at the plane behind them, they can see straight to the tail. The KLM tore straight through the middle of the plane. 335 occupants of the Pan Am flight were killed. 61 have survived. As firefighters tend to the blazing wreck of the KLM, they are completely unaware that a second craft was involved in the crash just down the runway from them. Pan Am survivors waiting for rescue are forced to jump down off the plane, many sustaining injuries in the fall. The co-pilot recalled how one woman had made the leap only to have other survivors jump after her and land on her, breaking her back, both arms and both legs. In all, 583 are dead and the 61 survivors are all left with varying levels of injury. It remains the deadliest aircraft accident in history. In the aftermath, KLM suggested that one of their most senior pilots, Captain Van Zanten, could aid in the investigation, yet unaware that he had died in the crash. The investigation laid bare all the circumstances that led to the disaster. The bomb explosion at Gran Canaria causing diversions, Captain Van Zanten's late decision to refuel, the sudden thick fog, the simultaneous radio transmissions, Pan Am's failure to spot their exit. Had any of these elements not been present, the disaster would have been averted. Had any of these events been delayed, some by even just seconds, the disaster would have been averted. But it wasn't all caused by unfortunate chance. Mistakes were made and in response, change has been brought about. Requirements were introduced for standardized phrasing. Terms like OK 
are no longer acceptable in air traffic instruction. This is to ensure that communication is clear and misunderstandings are avoided. Crew resource management evolved in cockpit procedure, encouraging mutual agreement in decision making. The captain should be freely challenged or contradicted by his crew, no matter their experience. Had KLM's flight engineer insisted that Captain Van Zanten was mistaken, or had Van Zanten more seriously considered his concerns, the disaster could have been avoided. Of course, we must consider that at the time, all the men involved had acted reasonably. And while the guidelines today are designed to mitigate the risks of random chance and earnest miscommunication, they didn't exist back then. What happened that day could have happened to anyone. If you were to put yourself in their shoes, you'd find yourself the victim of coincidence, a force you can neither see nor understand, a force that you would be completely oblivious to in your last moments.